Okay, I'll start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Love for It podcast. And today's guest is someone that we have had uh, probably more um, uh, more people asking about us having her on than, than, than almost anyone. And people have really requested further interviews and further videos with uh, Professor Rosalind Graham. And I've got a, an excellent introduction I'd like to read out that gives you an idea of um, just how just how much she's done in her career and everything that she's um, uh, experienced and that will be and will be able to share with us today. So, for nearly thirty years, Rosalind Graham has been a leading light in the field of healthful and compassionate living, inspiring thousands of people throughout the world. Her depth of knowledge and understanding in the areas of raw vegan health, natural hygiene, and emotional well-being have earned her international acclaim. As someone who's been eating an exclusively raw vegan diet and practicing the natural hygiene lifestyle for more than half of her life, Rosalind has a wealth of personal experience. And in recognition of her work within the natural, natural hygiene movement, Rosalind has been invited to become the Vice President of Healthful Living International. She was previously engaged as a lecturer of nutrition, health science and fitness concepts at Middlesex University, London, where she taught students of dance how to maximize their health and performance. And this work led to her in-depth studies and research into all types of disordered eating. And for decades, she's worked helping sufferers from all manner of eating difficulties regarding their physical and psychological health. And she's also studied psychology and undergone training in uh, counseling skills. She was previously employed by the Royal Navy as a consultant and lecturer in fitness, health and nutrition and a course director of nutrition studies for the College of Naturopathic and Complementary Medicine in London. And Rosalind has been one of our main speakers at the UK Fruit Fest over the last, since 2014. And she's been a speaker at many events around Europe and all over the world as well. She was also commissioned to write a book for the Daily Telegraph um, and uh, has um, spoken, as I said, all over the world. And we're looking forward to hearing more from her today. Uh, she also has a, a daughter, and is a proud mother and is very, has a lot of interesting things to say about education, homeschooling, parenting, pregnancy and things like that. So we may get into that as well. So Rosalind, I've covered a lot there, but is there anything more you would like to mention about yourself as an introduction? Ronnie, darling, I think that's more than enough. I really do. It's just a delight to be here and thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Well, every time you've spoken with us, Rosalind, we get a lot of requests for more information and, and people would love to connect with you more and find out more from you. So it's, uh, it's but I know that you've, you're, you're very busy and you've stepped back a little bit from um, being out there on the circuit, speaking and doing all sorts of things. But we're uh, obviously lucky to have you at the Fruit Festival again. I, I, will, I will just say to everyone, you can go to fruitfest.co.uk if you want to find out more about that and, and we do have some spaces left so please feel free to check that out so rosalind um something that people might want to know is were you um did you were you brought up in a kind of conventional diet and lifestyle absolutely ronnie my mother bless her was a really caring mother who always liked to home cook everything and she spent most part of her day either cooking it or washing up after it um, she put an enormous amount of love and effort into her food preparations, but they were very standard, you know, meat and two vegetables followed by a dessert or pudding of some sort. It was all very meat and dairy based and very grain based as well. And that's what I was originally raised on, Ronnie. Yeah. And um, what were the, did you ever have any kind of health issues as a result of that? Or did you manage to kind of miss out on that kind of stuff? No, I really did, Ronnie, massively. I mean, one thing was that I constantly battled with mucus and without being too um, revolting about it, essentially every morning was spent trying to clear this mucus from my system before I could get on with my day. I would walk around most of the time with a handkerchief blowing my nose and so on and had endless colds one after the other. But mucus was always a problem and it always also made me feel very nauseous 
And they used to suffer from a lot of nausea in the morning as a result of the accumulated mucus in my system. In addition to that, my skin was very, very poor. I suffered more than perhaps with my fair share of the teenage spots that went on into my early 20s as well. And my abdominal discomfort was on and off constant throughout my childhood. There always seemed to be a problem with either bloating or in other ways, feeling distended and being constipated or having issues there. But I think of all those things, Ronnie, to be honest, the one thing that really stole my quality of life throughout my early years the most was having severe eating disorders. And I truly believe that they were caused by an improper diet, accompanied, of course, by the inevitable emotional discord. But, but definitely, I think that I would have fared the emotional discord far more smoothly had I not been suffering from these food addictions, of course, without realizing they were addictions at the time. So the combination of the two was really quite lethal. And I suffered for many, many years. And did you, what, what was the, what was the first step for you in moving towards a healthier life? Did you um, start off, because I know you have a, back, a background in fitness and activities and dance. Did you start off on that side or was it the nutrition that came first or did they come together? That's a very good question, Ronnie. Yes, I've always been very physically active and I danced from a very young age. I used to be considerably overweight, which always really upset me with my dancing because it impeded my movements unquestionably. And I always felt rather like a baby elephant amongst all the other antelopes in the dance class. Um, so that, that was a big issue. I don't think that, however, my main reason for seeking out a more healthful way of living was to be a better dancer. I think ultimately it's because I was suffering so much from the aforementioned physical discomforts, but also very greatly because I realized that my eating was not in any way peaceful. I had terrible battles with my food, terrible addictions, um, all sorts of side effects psychologically and physically from those addictions. And it was that that sent me searching for answers. And Ronnie, I'm a woman who, or a girl in those days, who have always been very, very close to nature. I felt an, a tremendous connection with the natural world. And it was the natural world that I turned to for answers. I searched and searched amongst all wildlife I could find, and I could not find any evidence of an animal, a wild animal, suffering from food addictions, digestive disorders to any great extent anorexic giraffes, you know, um, compulsive eating lions, whatever it was, you know, they just weren't out there. And so being a simplistic girl, um, of which I still am, I preferred to kind of ask myself very simple questions. And my question that I asked myself was, if there's no evidence of any kind of disturbed eating patterns when one studies zoology, why is it that I am suffering in this way? And I have other friends, and one friend in particular, who was also suffering in a very similar fashion. Yeah. It didn't seem to me to be part of nature's plan. So that then led me, uh, led me to wondering, well, what is it we're doing that isn't in accordance with nature's plan? Because as I watched the animals, I realized that they were just following their own brilliant intelligence combined with their instincts, and they were foraging out the foods that they needed, and they seem for the most part to be doing extremely well on it. The only time I noticed obesity, for which, as I say, when I was younger, I suffered from, was amongst domesticated pets, the, the classic overweight Labrador or the overweight golden retriever or whatever it was that we had in our family at the time. This was the only time I saw an abnormal body composition as a result of food amongst animals. And then it dawned on me, well, we're actually exposing them to the human way of eating in many ways. You know, we're deciding on their behalf what they should eat, how much they should eat and so on. And so that was really the way forwards. It was via the natural world and realizing the incongruence of what I was suffering in comparison to the, to the natural world and what was going on there. So that's where my search really started, Ronnie. Mm. Out there with the birds and the bees. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's funny how... If people were a bit more connected to nature, a lot of these things would kind of make a lot more sense. I think um, I know that you've got a great love for animals and you, you care for a lot of animals. Were you a vegetarian from a young age? I chose to become a vegetarian at a young age. And it was not something that my family 
disapproved of, I'm glad to say. My mother was always immensely supportive. Um, <clears throat> I don't quite remember my father's reaction, but it was probably something of sort of surprise and assuming it was some kind of fad, I would think. But yes, uh, my mother was very supportive. I decided that for me, there was a complete um, nonsensical follow through on saying that animals were happy little farm animals, you know, the cow, the sheep, the pig, and so on in all my storybooks. And then, but here is one dead and burnt and chopped up on your plate, would you please eat it? Um, to me, you know, straight away, once the penny dropped, the change to vegetarianism was instant. It was nothing short of horror, really, at the reality of what I was being supposed to be eating and flatly refusing to do, do so. And I remember actually one particular day um, I can't tell you exactly what I was doing or where I was going, but I can remember the dress I was wearing. It was a somewhat sort of <clears throat> floral flouncy affair. <clears throat> and I remember being in this dress and suddenly thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I'm a vegetarian for the rest of my life. And I can remember that, <laughs> that, that quite distinctly, funnily enough, that moment. Um, yes, and obviously never turned back from that point and eventually went on to choose a vegan diet. And that was something of an amusing story because <clears throat> I went to the Mind, Body and Spirit Festival, I think it was, or it could have been something similar to that in London. Very proud of the fact that I was a vegetarian. So I went swanning around all these stands as a, as a teenager and I came across a stand which was promoting veganism. <clears throat> and so I went up to the people at this stand and I was looking at their paperwork and so on and puffed out my little chest with pride and said, oh, I, I'm, I've been a vegetarian for years. And they turned around to me and said, but don't you realize there's in as much animal suffering in the dairy industry as there is in the slaughterhouses? Oh, wow. And suddenly, a whole new world opened up to me. And I picked up their leaflets and I spoke to them and my eyes were opened. And once again, I walked out of that particular festival thinking, okay, I'm now a vegan for the rest of my life. <laughs> and that was the turning point for that. Uh, it was very interesting, though, that the problem was both of those approaches, as I took out the meat, as I took out the, you know, the, the, the poor little birds and the fish and everything else, followed by their mammary secretions and ovums and the whole business, that I was pushed more and more towards grains. Mm. This was an inevitable result. You know, the grains played a very high part in the diet, but unfortunately with me, that was my digestive and health and addiction downfall to a large degree. Um, it transpired later when I was discovered this through personal research that it was the grains that were really causing me such massive amounts of mucus. It wasn't just the dairy and the cheese. The grains were really contributing to that. And 100% were responsible for the problems I was having with bloating and, you know, the distension of my abdomen and constipation and so on and so forth. And I was wondering, I want to get back to that question on grains, but did you notice any any obvious changes when you made those changes in your diet, went vegetarian, went vegan? Do you remember any particular um, obvious changes at that point? Yes, I think one of the most profound ones was changing my energy levels. I felt I had a lot more energy. And at that point, I was very involved in a lot of physical activities and so on. It was noticeable. Instead of feeling sluggish and lethargic, I started to feel really quite vibrantly energetic. And that was a distinct change. The other thing that really changed was my skin. If you remembered, I mentioned earlier that I have very bad acne and problems with my skin, and that started to clear up quite dramatically as well. The problem was that the digestive problems didn't change. And that was because I was then on a very high grain based diet. And it wasn't until I got the grains out that my digestive system really started to return to its naturally healthy state. Yeah. So and, and, and I, I suppose, basically, what, what do you see as the problems with grains? I think that there's, there's, there's various things here, Ronnie. One is the fact that ultimately, if we examine our anatomy, our physiology, our biochemistry, it's very clear to see that we are designed to consume a largely fruit-based diet. I'm not saying exclusively fruit-based by any means, but with a large proportion of fruit in it. 
And if you look at the amylase in our saliva, for example, which is um, an enzyme that's going to break down you know, grains, what we find is that we have a tiny amount. Whereas if you look at the amylase in the, in the system of a bird, you are designed to feast on grains, their amount of amylase is enormous compared to ours. We right. have a little bit just so that we can cope with the little bits of fairly indigestible starch that we come across in our fruit when it's not quite so ripe, but we're certainly not designed to be eating grains. So the first thing is we suffer from a lack of ability to digest the stuff properly. Secondly, if you want to make alcohol, as you may well know, is that you put grains in somewhere that's warm and dark and wet and preferably add some bit of sugar to it and you've got alcohol. Well, most of us haven't looked inside our innards. Hopefully we won't have that opportunity, but were we to do so, we would find that it was warm and it was dark and it was wet. And if we then put in things like refined sugar, you know, the, the, the pure table sugar or the jams or the marmalades or, what, or the jelly as they call it in the States or whatever it is, and you mix that with the grains, which quite honestly is very common in most of our cakes and gattos and biscuits and so on and so forth. Yeah, sure. Have now, what we do, one of the products, as we all know, is alcohol. And so you've got alcohol going around in your system, which is very, of course, bad for your kidneys, apart from anything else. It stops you from being able to think clearly. It leaves you fuzzy headed, slightly drunk, if you like. And it's, it's altogether not a good idea to have that sort of stuff in your system. Now, in order for your adrenals to cope with the, the mess of trying to digest grains, particularly in the distillery, sorry, a, a, a sort of fermentation plant, you might say, is that it affects your adrenals a great deal. And your adrenals suffer. And the more your adrenals suffer, the less energy you have. The fibers in grains are actually very sharp compared to the fruit fiber, which is relatively soft. And those fibers, if analyzed under a microscope, are very like tiny little pieces of glass. Now, I come from a generation whereby at one point, whole foods was the thing. Whole wheat, brown, you know, whole grain bread, and brown pasta, brown rice, everything had to be brown and whole grain. And just in case you didn't get enough, you had to put in a couple of tablespoons of bran at each meal to make sure you got sufficient fiber and to keep yourself regular on the toilet. Well, bran in and of itself is incredibly sharp. It literally looks like tiny pieces of glass under an electron microscope. And so those tiny little pieces of glass are going to be going through your system and setting up inflammation because they are very irritating to the entire intestinal tract. Grains also contain opioids, which are obviously a relative of opium. And as most people know, opium is a very addictive drug. Hence the fact it's unlikely that we'll take one slice of homemade bread and say that's enough. We'll cut another and another and another and then finish the loaf off a little bit later on because opium and opioids are highly addictive and they affect how we perceive our world as well because they cause shifts in our perceptions of reality, usually to one of feeling a little bit more chilled out and blissful. Hence people used to get addicted to opium. So the great they have a whole heap going for them, quite frankly, Ronnie. Um, if all else failed, one also has to remember, if you're not convinced by all of that, that fruit, we can literally take it as it's presented to us on the tree. And apart from taking the outer shell off in some cases, we just consume fruit. Whereas grains, unless we sprout them, we need to heat them in order to render, render them digestible. And this brings me back to my very original thoughts when I was a young child of, is this what nature intends us to do? Now, I don't know about you, Ronnie, but I've searched through every book on zoology, animals, wildlife in my library. I've yet to find one who cooks its food. Now, I know there are monkeys in a certain part of the world that do put their food into warm temperatures before they eat it. And I'm not going to deny that. You know, there's always, there's always an exception to the rule. But generally speaking, 99.9% .9 of creatures do not cook their food. They eat what they've been provided in nature and it suits their constitution perfectly. And it's the same with the human being. We shouldn't be needing to denature, change, set light to, pervert, or in any other way, convert our foods to something else in order to be them, digest them and thrive on them. 
in my opinion, we should go out there into nature and, you know, there, lo and behold, is exactly what is going to suit our system without any alteration. Suppose with grains as well, the grain-based diet that the world, the world is on to a great degree really shapes the way the world looks in terms of the agricultural system and the way that uh, the grains have to be grown and continuously pulled up and, and then replanted and so on. Um, and, and a lot more land has to be used, I suppose, that that aspect of it as well. Absolutely, Ronnie. And, you know, now when the concerns for the environment are at such a peak, it really needs to be taken into consideration that when we can grow our food vertically, why would we want to grow it horizontally when we're going to use up more and more acreage of land in order to feed a far fewer number of people than we could with a piece of land a quarter of that size if we drew, grew our food vertically in the form of fruit trees? Wow, I, I, I never thought about it that way, the idea of growing food vertically. Yeah, amazing. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I don't know if I've ever heard such a good argument against grains, but, but obviously um, a lot of the vegan doctors and different people are supportive of grains and you do get people, I heard someone came to me recently when if I mentioned, and I don't really talk too much about being a, a raw vegan, but if someone finds that out, they might, share with me some information about we have that with the amylase you were talking about we they, they believe we've evolved a lot of amylase to deal with these cooked foods and that's what's helping us and that's how we've evolved what do you think of people that suggest that actually they believe human anatomy is has been affected by cooked food or is is has evolved or changed to be um adapted for cooked food do you, do you think that's not correct obviously the human form if we go right back to um you know darwin's theory of evolution and we look at the whole way that the human being has come about as a result of various transformations on a physical level prior to today's person we see that things have changed but ultimately from a dietary perspective we still have an intestinal tract that is a long, long intestinal tract. It hasn't become a short intestinal tract just because we keep eating meat. If you compare the length of our intestinal tract to a carnivore, it's completely different. It's way, way longer because a carnivore has to get that meat in one end and get it out the other quickly before it all putrefies and poisons them. Now we have a very long intestinal tract in order to process all the fibers that we will naturally come across in our plant-based diet. That hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. If we look at our eyes, you know, our, do we have the eyes of somebody who is a carnivore, for example? No, we have the eyes of someone who is going to be searching tree branches for fruit. They have a very different way of focusing and functioning. Are we supposed to shin up palm trees? Well, possibly so but we don't, have we lost our little toes because we would need them to do that? Um, I don't know very many people with only four toes on their feet. Overall, I think that it's, a, it's unlikely to put it at best that there's been any change whatsoever in recent years, probably since we have started to record history. And that's one heck of a long time in a relative sense, not relative to the, uh, the length of the planet Earth's existence or our existence upon it, but in terms of progressing through with science and understanding things more. I would be very challenged to find anything or any significant value that proves that we've changed one iota from our design of a very, very, very long time ago. Even though since mechanized agriculture, our diet has changed radically. Now, prior to mechanized agriculture, there was a far greater percentage of plant-based foods in the diet. Admittedly, they tended to be cooked plant-based foods, but nevertheless, there was only a very small relative amount of meat and dairy. Once mechanized agriculture came into play, suddenly, instead of the farmer being able to sort of spend half of his life trying to farm three acres, he could spend half of his day quickly plowing up two or 300 acres. And so the amount of food and grain that could be produced increased enormously. As a result, we were able to feed so much more, as they call it, livestock, a particular term that I, I dislike, but nevertheless, that is the correct term, apparently, socially. But however, 
this massive increase in meat production and dairy production started to have an impact upon human health. Now, this is very clearly seen in some studies that were done during the World War II and following World War II. Um, would you excuse me one second, Ronnie? No problem. Let's go back. So back, if we look at the studies done during World War II and after World War II, we see that during World War II, there was rationing that took place and the consumption of meat and dairy was significantly lower than any other time in that, in that sort of era. What we see absolutely matching that is the drop in heart disease, in atherosclerosis, arterial sclerosis, in people having strokes, in people having um, embolisms, all sorts of different things. It all reduced during that time. And then post-war, suddenly, the ration books are dispensed with, the chaps are home from the front, the girls are coming off the land and going back in the house to start cooking again, the men are working the land and suddenly the consumption of meat and dairy comes up again and match for match, so does atherosclerosis, heart disease, stroke, embolisms, thrombosis, all of these conditions. In fact, if it was put out on a line graph, you could literally lay one graph transparently on top of the other and see almost a exact match of the increase and decrease in all those diseases as dairy was increased or decreased. There was one particular study done in Norway which demonstrated this perfectly and it was very dramatic to see this, it was so clear. Yeah absolutely and, and there's something, uh, something that's been in my mind is that we tend to look at human history through the perspective of what's happening right now and the stories we've been told in our lifetime and what we believe is normal for what we see is around us. And that, te that tends to influence what people believe about the past a little bit. And there's many people now that suggest that humans at one point lived on commonly on a meat-based diet or, may, or maybe they want to believe human beings are carnivores. Certainly people will say hunter-gatherer with an emphasis on hunter. Um, what do you think is the likelihood of humans having ever been significantly a meat-based kind of an animal? And even like how the history of meat eating, how, how much meat eating have people actually done in the, in the course of history? It's very interesting, Ronnie, because this question opens itself up so much to both science, history, and very much um, philosophy as well. So it, it's an interesting mix of the three. Now, as far as meat eating goes, let's be clear in our history that there has been several ice ages. It's not just one ice age, there's been several ice ages that have occurred in our history. And each time humans have become stranded or isolated in some quite remote parts of the world. And many of those parts of the world it's not possible to grow the sorts of fruits that we like to feast on in our privileged lifestyle, yeah. nor is it easy to grow particularly vegetables. And so therefore the most likely way that they would survive is to take the life of another and consume that. It's a little bit like, you know, there's three men in a boat, um, <laughs> the lifeboat, if you know what I mean, after the ship's gone down, uh, they end up on the desert island and they start looking at each other thinking who's going to eat who here because it does become a point of pure survival. And I think that's certainly true that that would have occurred in certain pockets of the world. So there's no question about that. Now, does this mean that people are naturally carnivores? We have to look at what inspires us, what motivates us, what drives us to take action to do certain things. Now, according to our psychology, for most people, unless they are of a particular dark disposition, they do not relish the idea of taking a cow, a pig, a sheep or any other creature and killing it with their own bare hands, ripping it to pieces and then burning it over a fire and consuming it. People prefer generally to be vultures. In other words, they let someone else do the work for them and then they move in to pick up the kill. <laughs> so th this, is, this is natural human mentality. And certainly if you put a baby in a playpen with a rabbit and, you know, and, a, and, a piece, and an apple, it's not gonna start chewing into the rabbit and playing with the apple. It's gonna chew into the apple and play with the rabbit. 
It's, it's a natural human disposition. But if a person is in a situation where they are driven by a different motivation, that is, if I do not eat the flesh of this creature, I will perish. Suddenly it's their life or their life. Then they may well choose to move forwards and do that in order for self-preservation to be in place. So it's really worth considering that. It, what drives people? Now, by most people's nature, if you say to them, I would like you to go and spend a week in an abattoir, they would be horrified at the idea, even the most staunch meat eater. Yes. And it's interesting, interestingly enough, Ronnie, a poignant thing in my life is that um, my dear daughter, Francesca, is um, pl intending, planning, in fact, totally determined to become um, a veterinary surgeon. And she wants to become the first ever ethical veterinary surgeon. She wants to start up a whole school of her own, training vets to be ethical vets. And when we look into her veterinary training, we find that all vets have to spend an entire week in an abattoir. And this I find absolutely appalling and shocking. But when I go online and I go to the various student chat rooms, in those chat rooms, there are a lot of trainee vets who are not vegans, not even vegetarians, and they're absolutely horrified that they've got to go into an abattoir. And they discuss this over the forums on the internet. How can we get out of it? I can't face this. This is going to be hell on earth. What can we do? Can't bear it. And they're not vegetarians, really, and they're not vegans. So, and they admit it, but they cannot walk into these slaughterhouses, these students. Now, if we were carnivores by nature, wouldn't bother us in the slightest. You don't see cats, for example, with tears rolling down their faces as, a, as they carry a mouse in their mouths. No, this is what they do. They're fine with it, but we're not fine with it as a species. I do yes, think sir. we can be driven to do such things in order for self-preservation on some occasions. I even think the fact that it's hidden from children that parents won't say what meat is, what these products are. And there's always been a bit of a culture of, for example, various tribes and cultures will kill an animal, but then they pray or they thank it. And, and I've always thought a crocodile doesn't have to do that. It does, you know, it doesn't have any kind of feeling. Of <laughs> you know, that's just, and a cat, as you're saying, like it, it's just its nature. It doesn't have any ethical worries you know if it did it would really prevent it from fulfilling its uh, its, its its role so yeah I, i've always thought that the, the very fact that people have empathy and have the, these concerns around animal animal welfare is a big sign that we're probably not even psychologically designed to be a, a carnivore and i think ronnie you know i'm really putting my neck on the line here and uh, you may choose to edit this out of the interview but there's one thing that I do feel passionately about and point, I might even say passionately frustrated about to some degree, is the fact that so many people um, speak the words of religion and speak the words of God and talk about how God is all love and compassion, which is absolutely correct in my view. Um, and they talk about being loving, compassionate, being kind, being this is why we go to church so that we can all be loving, be caring, have empathy, be generous, don't be selfish, care for others, reach out to others in pain, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all coming from the various churches and synagogues and other such places. And yet these same people seem to somehow be blinded to the fact that they are investing their finances and their body into paying for animals which we know are sentient beings and it's been proven time and time and time and time again that they have feelings comparable to ours they feel pain definitely comparable to ours that they're investing themselves and their finances into having these animals terrorized tortured and murdered so that they can eat them and i find this the height of hypocrisy and the height of incongruence and a, a, a tragedy of the human disposition to be quite honest because that is not in my humble opinion and please forgive me for those who vehemently disagree but in my humble opinion that god did not put those creatures here on earth for us to murder and consume he used in fact in the words of the bible it uses the word dominion we shall have the dominion over the animals dominion does not mean kill and eat it doesn't even mean boss around 
um, in those days when the Bible was written, dominion actually means care for and be the guardians of. So anyway, thank you for giving me that yeah. opportunity to say my piece. But, but I, I do think it's so sad that children are also led to go to church, to be confirmed, to do all these things. And then you go home and you have Sunday lunch. And there's, there's some kind of sorted ethics there, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I, I came across an interesting piece of information I'd never heard before, but the, the Catholic tradition of Lent, where from, I don't know what it is, Pancake Tuesday or whatever, to Easter Sunday, the, the Catholics will, uh, are suggested to give something up, you know, so commonly they might give up chocolate or alcohol or whatever it is for a month or 60 days, however long it is. But I heard that actually originally it was they gave up meat, dairy, cheese, eggs. They basically gave up all animal products. Never came, I only came across that recently. I was really, uh, really surprised by that. So they basically went vegan for, the, yeah. for, for a, a space of time. And, you know, people have talked about where are the examples of people doing veganism and things like that. And, and there probably has been a lot more of it than, than people realize uh, for short periods of time. Um, but specifically going back to meat, um, from my experience, when I've spoken to, there's an idea that people have eaten a lot of meat through history. When I speak even to grandparents, and I, I didn't have the chance to speak to my great grandparents, but I could imagine that if I was to say to them, how much meat did you eat when you were younger? The, I don't know, my grandfather said it was once a week. Mm -hmm. and. The, the idea that people have been eating this huge amount of meat throughout history seems to be very far from the truth. Oh, yes, absolutely, Ronnie. I am totally agree with you on that. I think it's an, an assumption made by the uneducated, to put it bluntly. It really is, because when you look back, what you're saying is totally accurate. It simply wasn't the, the agricultural capacity to produce meat the way we produce it these days. For a person to be having meat effectively three or four times a day, totally unheard of in times gone by it wouldn't even be possible as i say it was recognized agriculture that turned turned the table on that that's what's made it yeah um a, a funny little aside um I, I i someone in my family an, an older gentleman was um uh diagnosed with gout and i know that gout was the kind of the disease of kings and rich people in the past and so on. And this man had a particular habit of eating a lot of beetroot. And his brother said to him, that'll be the beetroot that's caused that gout. And I thought that was <laughs> so funny. It's, just, it's so yeah. funny that the blame gets put on the healthy part of his diet. You know, it's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but people, yeah. People go tremendous lengths, Ronnie, to protect their addictions. This is the yeah. thing. So at some point you came across natural hygiene, veganism. Do you want to talk about that? Well, you, yeah, talk, you yeah, talked about that. finding it about, and I was, I was fascinated by how, with your, with your story about how you bumped into veganism, that it's so amazing to me that the people who are at that table probably never realized the impact they had in terms of it uh, impacting your life. And you've shared it with so many people, <laughs> but yeah, natural hygiene came along. What was that when you started to? It did, Ronnie. I mean, I was still on this path of searching. I've spent most of my life searching, um, mm -hmm. but I, I was still looking for answers. Still trying to, although I become vegan, I still had a feeling there was more. I didn't know what it was or where it was, but I had a feeling there was more. And at that time, I was a personal trainer and fitness instructor, and I was running some fitness classes. And this lady used to attend my fitness classes and she always had a terrible job keeping up because she was terribly overweight, seemed to have very little energy. She didn't look well, was always very dark under the eyes. And then one day she stopped coming to class and I tried to follow through, but basically got the message she was getting too busy, which was fine. But then some months later, I forget how many months, probably the best part of a year, to be honest, I walked into a shop and I looked at this woman who looked stunningly beautiful and slim and healthy and clear eyed and vibrant. And I thought, I can't think who that woman reminds me of, but it reminds <laughs> me of somebody. And I stood there <laughs> racking my brains 
when suddenly she swung her sparkly eyes around on me and said, Rosalind, she said, how lovely to see you. And then I realized by her smile, because I never forget a good smile, who she was. And of course it was this lady who I'd previously mentioned was so unfit and unable to keep up and unwell. W what happened? I said to her, you know, you are you're completely transformed and I'm so happy for you. You look so well. And out of her handbag, she pulled this book and it was Fit for Life by Harvey Diamond. And she plonked it in my hands and she said, you read that. She said, you'll love it. So I did read it. I did love it. And I was very inspired. And from that, I learned that there was an American Natural Hygiene Society because, of course, Harvey Diamond, bless him, was an American. And I found out about this American Natural Hygiene Society and decided this was just the ticket. This is what I was looking for. This is what I was interested in, which is a holistic approach to creating health, essentially. And so I bought myself an airline ticket and I flew to America on my own, not knowing where I was going, not knowing a single soul over there, but determined to pursue this, this, this search of mine. And I turned up at this American Natural Hygiene Society convention had an absolutely fantastic time, learned so much about natural hygiene. And whilst I was there, the twist in the tale is that I found out there was a British natural hygiene society that was just up the road from where I lived at home. So I then got on a plane and I flew back to the UK. And at that point, I got to meet dear Keki Sidwa, who has since passed over and uh, discovered all the beautiful work that he was doing to promote natural hygiene. And that was really the beginning of it, Ronnie. Uh, but I just became a passionate student of the subject and constantly traveled internationally to try and get more education, more information. Um, and that really did fill in the missing blanks and finally get my health where I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it wasn't until I became strictly raw vegan. And at that point was the only time I managed to completely and utterly free myself from eating disorders because previously I'd been anorexic, I'd been bulimic, I'd been a compulsive eater, you name it, I had the t-shirt, yeah? Um, but it was going raw vegan that finally brought me peace with my food. All the addiction stopped and the healing took place. With the, the eating disorders thing, that's something that is, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite common uh, in, in the world in general. I think there's, I think there's even millions of people, I think the numbers are in the UK that are to some degree touched by it or suffer from some level of eating disorders. It may even be 7 million, I think is a very large number. Um, so it's not a vegan issue is what I'm trying to say. It's not something specific to any particular diet really. But we do see it in the raw foods world where people are, uh, are have, have these problems or have come from a background. I think what I see is that a lot of people struggle to get out of that, that place. And what would you say, how, how, how do people make that journey to, to get away, to get away from that, to a healthier relationship to their self and, and food? How does that happen? Because it seems like a lot of people get stuck in it for a long time. Yes, they do, Ronnie. And I mean, for me, it wasn't an instant fix. There was a lot of deep sort of inner psychological, emotional work that I had to do alongside of it. And I think this is a big key. You, know, you can only make dietary improvements successfully and long term to, do, to the degree that you do inner work on your psychological, emotional self. You cannot still be a psychologically and emotionally unhealthy person and succeed on a raw vegan diet. They literally go hand in hand. It's a bit like if somebody had a broken leg and they've got a plaster cast on that leg. It doesn't matter how many times you say, take the darn plaster cast off and walk. Or today I'm going to walk and I'm not going to walk with the plaster. Cast. You'll fall over every time you've got a broken leg. You have to heal the emotional, psychological self. And then the plaster can come off and then you can walk. So it's very much a tandem process. It is not an Diet. Um, and I think that's very important. Now, unfortunately, mm. the factors at play here. One is from a physical, practical perspective, many people who are trying to embrace a raw vegan diet are living with people who are not. They might not even be vegetarian, might not even be vegan, but certainly are, you know, cooked vegans. And it's a little like asking an alcoholic 
to go and work in a pub and get over their addiction. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very, very difficult. So to be extracted from that sort of environment is ideal. And in many cases, necessary for a person to make the changes they want to. It is really challenging to overcome addictions whilst you're constantly surrounded by the smell, sight, and so on of that same substance around you all the time. It is very, very difficult. And for those in those situations, I think various things can be done. One is that they need to have an honest heart-to-heart discussion with those with whom they live to explain the severity of how much their addiction is destroying their life quality and to ask for their assistance as much as they possibly can, not necessarily by converting to be a raw vegan themselves, but simple considerations like trying to perhaps, if they're flatmates, do their cooking at a certain time when the person who's trying to recover is not in the house or at least putting things in a separate part of the fridge so they don't, or wrapped up in bags, they don't have to be seen by the person who's trying to recover. All sorts of little tricks, anything and everything to help make a more conducive environment for that person to heal, to get away from that substance. I know a lot of people, particularly women, who try to get over their eating disorders, embrace a raw vegan diet, and yet their children are still being fed cooked food, whether it's cooked vegan food or whatever. This is very difficult because obviously they're there they're literally standing over this stuff all day long. And the temptation when you, you know, cut up a piece of bread or something is to pop a piece in your mouth. If you're very addicted to it, it's understandable. At that point, one of the best things that one can do is whenever you are handling and preparing foods that are not raw vegan and you're trying to be a raw vegan, always have a raw vegan nibble bowl right by your hand. It's a simple, practical thing. But if you're standing there and you're trying to make spaghetti bolognese for your children because your husband believes they need to have cooked food and you love spaghetti bolognese and you're tempted to stick your finger in and lick it, right next to you, have a bowl of whatever your favorite raw vegan food is. It doesn't even prove it's something high fat at that point. The key is that you get rid of the addiction. If having a bowl full of sunflower seeds next to you is going to stop you from going down back on the cook road and getting on your path, then go for it. Providing, of course, you've not got an underlying health condition that makes that contraindicated. And then once you've managed to really secure your adherence to a raw vegan diet, then you can start getting your, you, you know, your calorie nutrient ratio correct. But put whatever you need next to you, have it available, have it on the counter, reach for that every time. If you find that's not working, you can make up a new rule for yourself, which says I have to have 12 mouthfuls of something raw for one nibble of the cooked stuff I'm preparing. And a lot of the time, by the time you get to a 12th mouthful, you think, oh gosh, I've got this far. I think I can cope. <laughs> there are lots of little tricks that you can do, really practical. And some of them might seem somewhat idiotic, um, but they really do work for me, these things. Very basic, I know, but they can work. Excellent. And something I want, you, you touched upon the calorinutrient ratio and things like that in the raw foods diet. And, and something that I've come across recently, and I've heard this before, is sometimes you'll see people, even people who used to maybe promote the raw food diet or have books and websites and, and they no longer do it or they fell off the diet. And some people will then say, uh, well, they didn't do it right. And, and then we get criticized because they say, well, who, who's, who's to say they didn't do it right whatever it is that people say um, or they'll say that these raw foodists they're always making excuses that everyone's not doing it right and everything. Um, do you think a raw food diet can be done incorrectly absolutely Ronnie absolutely 100% and I think the thing is that when it comes to all these wonderful enthusiastic speakers and leaders out there particularly now we've got the internet and so many more people have a potential stage from which to share their enthusiasm. A lot of these people, if not, perhaps I might say most of these people do not have educationally and academically a scientific background. They are people who are oozing enthusiasm, oozing positivity, and it's wonderful. The qualities, those qualities are invaluable to the movement, but however, they are simply that. They're not academic qualifications. They're not scientific areas of education. And so what tends to happen, they share with the general public or those who they consider their students, 
they share with them what they're currently doing. Because whatever they're currently doing, they believe to be the answer. But because they're on the journey themselves, what they're currently doing will change. And so what they start to advise their students changes. And then the whole thing loses its, its validity, quite frankly. Now, it should always be based on science because nutrition is a science. Yes, it does dovetail with psychology, of course, as we've just been covering when discussing eating disorders. But ultimately, nutritional science is a science. And this is why when people, and they often ask me, oh, Rosalind, what do you eat for breakfast? What do you eat for lunch? And I refuse to answer, not because I've got anything to hide, because it makes it personal to me rather than scientific. I'm not interested in somebody following my way of eating in an attempt to get well. I'm interested in helping them understand the science behind what is or what constitutes healthy eating, which is a completely different thing. Um, it needs to be deeply rooted in an understanding of human anatomy, biochemistry, um, and also physiology to understand how the body reacts with certain foods and what the human body needs. So as much as all this enthusiasm and passion is a great injection into the movement, it has to be seen as nothing more than that. And for people to not follow such teachers for their necessarily scientific knowledge, but just for their inspiration, which is great. But for their scientific knowledge, they need to go to people who have that education and can share it with them. Yeah, and, and something I'd like to ask you about that I think is very interesting is um, the subject of dietary reference intakes or recommended daily allowances, whatever people want to call it. So there are, whoever it is, nutrition bodies, um, institutes, I'm not sure who come up with the information, but they will have reference intakes of how much protein, how much fat, how much carbohydrate, how much um, of every single nutrient virtually. Um, some of it more accurate than, than others, I think they admit that, but um, sometimes a person might be concerned that their raw vegan diet or some of those foods or they've checked it out and maybe it's slightly low in certain fats or the protein could be higher or whatever it is. Um, do you think people should be concerned about that? Should they be going out of their way to try and hit all these numbers? Do you have any, uh, any knowledge on where these numbers come from and how they've been created? Um, there's quite a, few, quite a few questions there, Ronnie, and I thank you for all of them because they're all such interesting, valid questions. Firstly, I would say from a very simplistic perspective, if we were all supposed to analyze our food and do the math before we consumed it, it would mean that God only intended intelligent people to survive. Now, I, I, I don't think this is necessarily so. And I really don't think that fragmenting everything down to its tiniest molecules in order to decide whether it's meeting our needs and it's suitable is part of the divine plan. I think we have been provided with a whole smogger's board of delicious fruits, nuts, seeds, and so on, and vegetable matter on which to feast. And providing that over a period of time, we get a good variety of that fare, we should fare very well indeed. What I think is far more the point is that most of the diseases in the Western world are not due to lack of. You don't get people very often dying because of a lack of zinc or a lack of magnesium, or they, they haven't had enough cobalt or whatever the darn thing might be. The fact is people are tending to die because of excesses, too much fat, too many calories, too much alcohol, too much smoking, too much carousing, not enough sleep, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're, mostly we're suffering from diseases of excess, not diseases of lack in the first place. The other point being here too, Ronnie, that once we start to try and analyze every food and nutritional content and start taking supplements here and there and balancing things out, we are effectively playing God ourselves. We've become the, the designer of what is suitable for us. And that again is unnecessary. And it's important to consider that if we take an excess of a certain mineral or vitamin, for example, it has, can have a suppressing effect on another one. The, the way that it functions is something I'll call the law of the minimum. We have to have the minimum of, everything drops down to the minimum. We have to have everything present. In the 
So if one of those things that has to be present in order to function is reduced, the whole level of functioning drops down in line with that lower level, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So some new things are definitely suppressive effects on others. And we start to reduce our overall functioning by taking isolated supplements. Sure, if you have symptoms of certain deficiency or certain thing, by all means, take a supplement. But just random supplementation because you've done a little bit of math and you think you could be lacking this or that really is a rather dangerous game to play. Now, the two exceptions that I would make here, one is vitamin D3. I think that due to the amount of smog that exists in the cities, the damage to the ozone layer that, of course, has been largely repaired during lockdown, which is all very encouraging, but various other things. Um, we are not getting the exposure of sunshine on our skin that we could were that, that light more safer. Um, but of course, the, the sunshine, unfortunately, isn't as safe as it used to be. Another reason is that when the sunlight hits our skin, it has been passing through an unending amount of chemical pollutants in the air. And that has been caused a create a sort of toxic cocktail that can then sometimes meet our skin. So the sunshine isn't what it used to be. Plus the fact people have been taught that they must, you know, what is it? Slap on the sunscreen, slip on a t-shirt and slap on a hat, you know, to cover up and keep out of the sun because the sun gives us some cancer. And I'm not denying for a minute that getting burnt by the sun and having excess sun exposure is not a dangerous game. It's a very dangerous game to play. But that is one vitamin, vitamin D3, which I think um, would obviously be a good one to take just to make sure that you're getting sufficient vitamin D because without vitamin D, you cannot use your calcium properly and that's going to affect your bone density. So particularly for women who are postmenopausal and so on and at risk from osteoporosis, they have to be very careful making sure they've got their vitamin D3. Many people suffer from a lack of ability to sleep at night. They suffer from insomnia. That again is a sign of vitamin D3. If you have any questions, go and get a blood test. Just ask your doctor, say, can I just check me out for D3? Taking excess amounts of D3 is not recommended as that can cause other problems. So you need to have it, you know, get checked out, find if you need some, if you do take it. The other one is vitamin B12. We've destroyed so much of the healthy bacteria in our soil, um, not to mention my gut part of the time, that vitamin B12 can be an issue. It's vital. It can have some very nasty consequences for us when it's absent. So taking a B12 supplement is also something that I recommend, although not necessarily to the degree that it's uh, those who are trying to sell it would like you to take it, perhaps a little less often or a little lower dose than they might recommend. But overall, supplementing with that vitamin, I think is a good idea in this day and age. Outside of that, I think unless you're experiencing symptoms of deficiency, the chances are you are not deficient. But do watch what you're overindulging in. That's far more of a problem. So you've, we've touched upon natural hygiene and we might go into some of the principles there if we have some time. But one thing that I think I see with people that get interested in natural hygiene is they develop a perspective of almost that they should try and avoid medicine completely. And what's your take on that? I think that, first of all, Ron, you know, my heart goes out because I think it is understandable that people would adopt that attitude. They, they would think that providing they meet all their body's needs to be healthy, they have no need of the medical fraternity. And perhaps also they become more aware of the dangers of toxicity, which is, how can I put it? These days, toxicity in the human body is number the one, number one concern, I think, of all people who are trying to strive for health. There's so much around us from electromagnetic waves to the food, to the pesticides, to the drugs, to everything. It's all around us. So I, I do understand people who might feel that way. But I also think that dying for a philosophy is not a recommendation that I would make. I think that natural hygiene is about making intelligent, educated choices. It's not about just a complete blanket attitude of throwing out the entire medical fraternity and all of medical science in order to just sit under an apple tree and all will be well. Now, the certain things that the, um, the NHS in this country and the medical, you know, medical model throughout the Western world does 
and that is that they are very good and useful for diagnostics. If you are having a problem, it's very, very helpful to tap into their scientific know-how to find out exactly what is going on. Once you've found that out, it's then your choice as to how you move forward with that and which approach you take to trying to right the situation. But it takes the guesswork out of trying to come to a conclusion as to what's ailing you because assumptions can be extremely dangerous. Assumptions are never good, particularly when it comes to health. So diagnostics is good. The other thing that's really valuable about the medical fraternity is their ability in their emergency care to buy people time to change their diets and lifestyle. Take for example, somebody who has, has got more than one coronary artery completely blocked up with saturated fats and cholesterol. They're having crushing angina pains and you know, a heart attack literally is awaiting for them around the corner. They may not have time to change their diet and lifestyle. And therefore they go into the hospital, they have bypass heart surgery. Now, admittedly the bypass heart surgery hasn't solved the problem because unless they change their diet and lifestyle, the bypass is going to block up in exactly the same way. But the point is by going through that procedure, they've been bought time to live more healthfully and to eat a better diet and to eat less and to so on and so forth. So for me, the two of the most valuable aspects of the medical model are diagnostics and emergency care. If you have pneumonia, it's not a time to sit around saying, oh, I think I might start reading about natural hygiene. You need to go in there, you need to get sorted. It's a very dangerous condition. Same thing, kidney infections, it's another one. Kidney infections can move to sepsis in no time at all. You don't sit around saying, oh dear, I've got a kidney infection, so I'll call up and see if there's a fasting facility available sometime in the next six months. You know, the fasting festival might be there, but you won't, right? So, so uh, yeah. You <laughs> yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, diagnostics is, diagnostic techniques is interesting to me because in sometimes in alternative health, and the raw vegan lifestyle, even we see people that have developed various alternative diagnostic techniques, apparently. Um, one would be iridology, where the eyes are examined. There's one called kinesiology, where muscle testing is involved. There's a number of different things. What's your opinion on some of these? To be honest, Ronnie, I'm not an expert in the particular modalities to make an educated sort of statement on this. One thing I do know for sure is that there are many different ways of looking at the same thing. And therefore I'm totally open to accepting that some of these approaches may be extremely valid. What I do believe though, is that any, just like a therapy, any alternative diagnostic investigation is as good as the person who's doing the investigation. So I would warn people against people who've like done a weekend course in ideology, ide ideology, 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 sorry, iridology. <laughs> oh, I didn't slip there. Um, you know, who've done a weekend course and sort of looking in your eye and saying, oh yes, you know, don't worry about this, uh, these crushing pains in your chest, it's just indigestion. Um, for example, oh, yeah. I, you need to look into the credentials of the person doing this, look at the reviews that they've had and um, really evaluate them before you put effectively your life in their hands. Yeah, yeah. and um, just to, to come to um, the festival, which will be at this year again, which will be good fun. And you've put together, a, or you are putting together a list of talks, uh, how to create series. I, I'll go through a little bit of some of the things that we've been looking at, or you've been looking at sharing, how to create more joy, uh, mental gardening, weeding out negativity, con and condemnation, planting seeds of happiness and hope, how to create vascular health, how to create strong bones, how to create a healthy back, neck and jaw, how, how to create healthy joints. So these are some of the completely brand new presentations you're going to be providing this year that you've never given before at, at the festival. Um, what's why, why are these so important for you to want to share? You know what, Rani, it's, it's interesting that you ask that. It's just that over the years, you know, when we go back in my own history, I did used to deliver these sorts of presentations on a regular basis, primarily across the USA. 
And I was always about science and I was always about practical application of the sciences and so on. And then my own sort of evolution, if you like, led me towards talking a lot more about the philosophies and ideologies of life, and psychology and emotions and all these sorts of things. And because so much of the work that I used to do appears to me somewhat, I'm not going to say outdated in its content, but outdated in that everyone seems to be so progressive in their own education. I would wonder what I could bring to the audience that they didn't already know. Mm. And what has come to my attention is that so many people, and it almost seems like some sort of design, divine choreography, so many people came into my life and were asking me some questions that I thought were surprisingly, in my mind, basic about creating certain aspects of their health. And it dawned on me that because I've taught this for so many years and because it's such an integrated part of my life, it doesn't appear new to me. And then I realized that there's many people out there who it's absolutely new to and whose opportunity to be educated in those areas simply hasn't arisen. And so actually it is valuable what I have to say and it is potentially going to really help people and that I need to get out there and, and deliver some of it again. Um, so that's really the bottom line, Ronnie. I think it's it's just a lot of people coming to me and saying, you don't realize how many people need to hear this. And the truth is, no, I don't realize or I didn't realize, um, but I'm starting to. And so I'm dipping stuff from the past and saying, yeah, actually, you know, it's still, it's still the same today. The science hasn't changed. Science doesn't generally change if it's actually based in fact. So it's not outdated and it's needed. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll help a lot of people. I'm looking forward to that. Absolutely, that's that's excellent. And um, something I wanted to maybe finish off with, we've got a little bit of time left, but um, you talk, you, you're quite passionate about natural hygiene and not just talking about diet or particular aspects of health. Maybe you could share your philosophy basically on natural hygiene, what that all means. And also maybe you could share some of the resources that uh, people could maybe look into to study and learn more about this subject? For sure, Ronnie. Well, it's very difficult to, and excuse the, the pun, but to put natural hygiene in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> the best way to explain it, I suppose, is return to the simplistic side of me, which is considerable. And that is to invite people watching this to consider house plant. And to think of a house plant, you bring it home from the, from the garden center or from wherever it is you get it, and you, you bring it home and you think, now, in order for this house plant to thrive, I need to learn how to look after it. You know, how much do I water it? Can I give it tap water or does it not do well on tap water? Does it like lots of sunlight? Not much sunlight. You know, does it like to be in a warm place? Should I keep it away from the radiator? Whatever it is, has it got the right sort of soil? There's so many different aspects of that plant's needs in order for it to thrive. Well, Let's just supposing that that person looks it all up in a book and they read all about it and they give it the right sort of soil and they give it the right sort of water and they feed it and they play Mozart to it and they tell it they love it and all sorts of things. And then they can't quite decide where to put it in their house. So they shut it in the cupboard under the stairs. And a friend comes around and they say, look, I don't know if you can help me. I'm really, really worried about my plant. It's just not doing well. It's gone all whitish yellow and it's wilting. And they open the cupboard under the stairs and they say, look, I've been watering it and feeding it and playing it Mozart and telling it I love it and everything else, but look at the state of it. And the friend stares at them and says, but you didn't give it enough light. It needs light. Mm. And our human body, Ronnie, is no different. Our human body has basic needs and it only takes one of those needs not to be met and we're going to wilt in our pot. We're not going to thrive and look perky and burst into bloom. It, it isn't possible. So natural hygiene really is about identifying which aspects of your lifestyle, of your self-care are lacking and then doing something about that to the best of your ability. It's about discovering what the human being is naturally designed for in terms of its diet and lifestyle in order to maximally thrive. And that includes our psychology and it includes the spiritual aspects of ourselves as well as the whole person. And, and the, the, the term holistic health has been used for a long time now. It sort of came out decades ago when people were 
you know, putting two tablespoons of bran on their breakfast every morning. But holistic health in the true sense really means holistic health creation. And that means identifying everything that you need. It doesn't matter whether it's more hugs, whether it's more smiles, whether it's lighter workload, whether it's earlier nights, whether it's doing more flexibility work to keep your muscles supple, or whether it's eating more fruit and less whatever else. Whatever it is, it's identifying those needs. And just like there are so many different types of plants out there, there's so many different types of people. And although in a very basic sense, we could say, well, one size fits all, you know, low fat, raw plant-based diet, organic if possible, get plenty of sleep, don't get stressed and exercise, sort of fits everybody. We are all individuals. We have individual different needs. Some people thrive on living as a hermit. Other people thrive when they're surrounded by their contemporaries, friends and family. So it isn't a case of one size fits all in every aspect of natural hygiene. It's a case of really studying the self, not in a narcissistic sense. And this is the absolute key of natural hygiene. The whole point of really taking care of ourselves is not purely so that we can thrive whilst all those about us fall apart. The point of it is, to the degree that we have our needs met on every level, there is a matching degree to which we are able to demonstrate loving kindness and compassionate benevolence to all life forms. And that's a very important part of natural hygiene. So it's not a narcissistic exercise. It is a bit like a mother taking care of herself so she can be there for her child. By taking care of ourselves, the more we take care, the better we thrive, the more we have our needs met on every level, the more we can be fountains of love and compassion and light for the rest of the world. And so there's a very, for me, large part of spiritual and um, an ideological aspect of natural hygiene. Well, thank you very much, Rosalind, for sharing some time with us and uh, some fascinating answers. I'm sure we'll get a lot of good feedback from that. Um, of course, you're going to be at the festival, but what else? If people want to get in touch with you or find out more about you, or um, the, the, I, I know that you've had some projects in the last year, uh, especially related to the veganism, you may want to share. So if you want to share with us what's happening with you and oh, thank you. what you've got to share. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Um, well, I'm currently um, a very busy mummy, <laughs> as you can imagine, trying to get my darling daughter through vet school, which is no mean feat. Um, and I do care for a large number of animals as well as try and run my home and other things connected. I really am looking forward to being at the UK Food Fest more than I can say at this point in my year and seeing Ronnie in person. Ronnie, hi, and giving you a hug is just another highlight. If people want to pursue what I'm pursuing at the moment and thereby by default connect with me, um, I have created the Curable Unity, which I invite people check out online it's k-a-r-u-n-a -A, karuna meaning compassion in action and the second part of that is unity karuna unity and what i'm endeavoring to do is bring as many vegans of the world together as i can in one united voice to bring education and um, hope to the rest of the world largely through arts and through the performances of artisans so i'm very very keen to have you join up with us and, um, and join in I am also offering, and I will say this now, my own contribution, as I really feel very passionate about spreading the vegan message. I am offering um, courses in public speaking for anybody who is a, um, an authentic, established vegan who feels that they could get up on stage and they could help spread the vegan message. Please do seek me out via the Karuna Unity and um, you will be very welcome along to one of my courses which is free of charge it's a 20-hour course in how to become a public speaker specifically to spread the word of veganism so so do let me know if you can do but in the meantime um, i will be putting together some written articles which i think these days they're called ebooks uh, <laughs> i'm trying to get in with the lingo here ronnie and um, they're going to be available on doug's website food and sports so i'm hoping to do a little series on there so if people want to check that out, they're very welcome to do so. Excellent. And we'll put all the links below if people want to check out 
more information on that, there will be links below the videos so you can um, go and find those things easily. Thank you very much, Rosalind. And everyone, I would like to thank you all for your for watching, for listening. If you have any feedback, feel free to send us a message, info at fruitfest.co.uk. You can go to fruitfest.co.uk and uh, learn more about the event there and join our newsletter and you'll get notifications. And uh, there are, there will there, at this point, there'll be not many places left, but please do get in touch with us if you're interested in coming. And we'll be, uh, and you'll be able to learn so much more from, from Rosalind and get a good chance to ask her more questions and so on. Um, well, thank you very much, Rosalind. Any last questions before we finish? Any last uh, thoughts? Sorry. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I do claim my own opinions when they're outside of science as my own opinions. So I hope I haven't offended anybody in anything that I've said because it's just a sincere heart sharing from me and um, how I see things. Doesn't mean necessarily that's how you see it, and I respect that. Um, very much do hope you're going to come along to the fruit festival. The number of people who say to me who initially was slightly hesitant in going, who since then have said that they wouldn't miss it for the world and they're going to come back year after year, um, is it's quite a high number. So I really encourage you, if you haven't been before, check it out. I can guarantee you, you're not going to have any regrets. It's the most fabulous experience. And particularly at this time in history, when everything is so uncertain, it's great to go back to such a solid community that we have at the War um, UK Fruit Fest. And Ronnie is such a fantastic leader and makes everybody feel welcome. And if there's one thing I just want to say that I really admire, I've always admired about you, Ronnie, is that you are so fair to everybody and everybody is treated equally and everybody is treated with the same rights. And I think that's such an admirable quality. And I think it's very important that people who are potentially coming to the festival should know that, that this is a, a really a festival of equality and decency and right action. So thank you, Ronnie, so much. Thank you very much, Rosalind. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening and supporting us. Feel free to share this with anyone you think it might be, it, it might uh, resonate with. And we'll see you in another episode of the Love Fruit podcast.